Watch 38 coming near you. Well, I'm, I'm not surprised people are feeling very raw at the moment, and that's why I came today, to, to be here, to see it for myself, to offer what comfort I could, but you can't always, in, all, in every circumstance, I think everyone understands that. How are you? I'm only shaking your hand if you give more funding to our RFS. There's so many people here have lost their homes. We need to meet. We need more help. So that is Scott Morrison getting some bad, epically bad PR. Took a holiday to Hawaii. Worst timing ever. Bad reactions. Bad, bad, bad. Australia is on fire, and it's bigger than you think. 12.35 million acres of land have been burnt by bushfires so far. That's almost twice the size of Belgium, and three times more land than the 2018 California fires and Brazil's 2019 Amazon fire combined. Flames have reportedly reached 70 meters high. That's taller than the Sydney Opera House. At least 19 people have been killed and more than 1,400 homes have been destroyed. Residents and tourists have been forced to relocate. Just get out while we can. Nearly 500 million animals have died in New South Wales alone. The fires aren't just in one location. They're raging everywhere across the country. So what ignited this deadly crisis? Well, bushfire season is nothing new in Australia, but this summer has been one of the hottest and driest in the country's history. Since September, the combination of drought, unprecedented heat waves, and strong gusty winds has created a recipe for disastrous fire conditions. On top of that, the smoke from bushfires generates its own weather, sparking thunderstorms with lightning and strong winds, which create even more wildfires. Scientists have been predicting such extreme weather for years, warning that bushfires will become even more frequent as climate change worsens. Although the weather has cooled slightly in parts of Australia, authorities say with months of summer left, the worst is yet to come. What is the cause of this crazy drought? We can see here we have cut down. Most of the forest in Australia has been cut down for meat and dairy and production of grain for the meat and dairy. We're going to zoom in up here to go to Papua New Guinea, who doesn't really have a meat and dairy culture yet, and it's very green, very lush. All right, now we compare it down to Australia, which subtropical area, Brisbane, etc. <clears throat> in down even here, we had a lot of forest, but look at that green. So you've got the dark greens of forest and the light green is grass-fed meat and dairy. And we we grow, I think we grow more grass-fed meat and dairy than anywhere on the planet. It is is incredible. It's a massive food industry for us. And it's destroyed our environment. But what happens is we lose, we cut the trees down and then the air passing over the air, the, the sorry, the air passing over the trees hasn't, doesn't have much water in the air and no rain happens or less rain happens. So... 
you always get more rainfall where there's trees because air passing over trees creates clouds and creates more rain and it just feeds that cycle when you kill the trees you kill the rainfall that's why it very rarely, rarely, rarely rains in a desert because there's no trees to create rain there's air but no trees there's wind but no trees so the moisture doesn't get taken up from the trees and that keeps that cycle going so what we've done now we've cut down all the trees for our meat and dairy lives and that is the cause of the drought and that is the cause of the crazy bushfires because of less rain the all the woods the forests are more dry you know, the forests are more dry and just this is insane we have just cut down australia for our quest for meat and dairy grass-fed most australian meat is grass-fed most australian dairy is grass-fed i think it's like 90 98 is grass-fed meat and dairy here and Australia, we are obesity, one of the obesest couple, uh, countries in the world, obesity capital. We even have here, there's dots out here. Some people say these dots are fracking, fracking sites, which use a lot of water. I disagree. I thought they were, but it seems to be their bores for grazing. This is a sheep town out here, sheep and cattle. And we'll zoom it in. We'll zoom it in. Zoom it in. Come on, keep zooming in. This is amazing, Google Maps. We can see the destruction and for me, this looks like, it looks like a blast thing, but these, for me, look like animal tracks going in and out. Does that look like animal tracks to you? It looks like animal tracks to me. There's no green, there's nothing, and there's a well there. So for me, it seems like there's a trough there, and if that's where the sheep go, etc. So me, I think I can see sheep in that picture there, and that is the animal industry. Another example, we've cut down the trees. There used to be trees there, but cut them down. It makes it easy to muster up the animals for slaughter so that's what we've done we just cut down the trees put in these boars and look, look at how dry that is that's like fantastic that used to be forest that used to be forest long 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 time ago 100 years ago 200 years ago it's all green forest savanna beautiful savanna woods all cut down for grazing because it's very very hard to round up sheep in a forest so they burn the forest out and it creates more room for meat and dairy. And we scan over here. We can see there's a bit of stuff here through Fraser Range. It's still green. Not much grazing through there. But then we drop down for the light green color. And we see Esperance, etc. And this Fraser Range is actually... This road's actually blocked now because of bushfires. It's nuts. And look at all that. Look at that meat and dairy. Just cut down meat and dairy and grain to feed the meat and dairy in the US, etc. Most of our grain goes to, lot, to, to export to feed livestock around the world. It's nuts, man. What are we doing? We are killing Australia. We are killing the world with our quest for meat and dairy. So every time you eat meat and dairy, you're essentially cutting down forests and uh, that's causing massive decrease in rainfall. And look at those up north here. This is just, you know, this was once forest as well. Uh, many hundreds of years ago, burnt a lot by the Aboriginals of Australia. The Aboriginals would burn off the forests to catch kangaroos, etc. And then the deserts, you know, the forest is gone, and so the rainfall drops, and it becomes a desert. And in Australia, we do have desert. We naturally have a bit of desert in the middle, but it's become bigger and bigger and bigger and more widespread because the forests were burnt down. Now, let's go up to the far north Queensland. We can see here, these beautiful greens there. That's Crape Jubilation. That's where Freely lives. Beautiful area out there. Beautiful rainforest. Amazing area. And we also have a bit of dairy in there the dairy is coming in the dairy is coming in and you can see it's being chopped down a bit of sugar cane as well sugar cane doesn't take up that much room it's pretty uh, pretty dense it's a pretty decent crop but dairy it takes up a lot of room for not much you, know, you need sugar you need fruit but you don't need dairy and meat unless your obesity is your goal and so we have here scroll down here to the cans and stuff like that uh mossman and we just see more meat and dairy just cutting down that green. This is, I mean, this is world-class rainforest. Mount Lewis National Park. And I've been through here on my bicycle. It's just a beautiful, beautiful area. But it's getting destroyed every month. Literally every month more forest is getting taken down to grow boom for meat and dairy. Meat and dairy. We're importing so much to China now. The dairy imports to China are huge. We are importing, exporting... Uh, Sorry, we're sending dairy from Australia to China, to Korea, the the dairy, the baby formula. Baby formula is going nuts. You can go to a supermarket here and it's just Chinese tourists or Chinese locals just sending it, buying it and sending it back to China. It's a huge money. Even the Australian 
Australia Post has a little office where they can just, you can send you can send dairy to straight to China from one of their post offices. It's, it's nuts. It's, it's it's crazy. But this is just getting worse and worse and worse. This is the cause of the drought. Don't get distracted. It's fun to make fun of politicians, but please, people, do not let the cause of this go unnoticed. This is the cause: meat and dairy. Let's watch more. Let's watch more. This is crazy. So Natasha just asked me, how does cutting down forests uh, cut down rainfall? Because what happens is the the air passing over the forest picks up moisture given off by the trees and plants it fuels rain. So when the trees disappear, so does some of the rain. So it's a very strong impact. Air travelled over a lot of forests brought a lot more rain than air that didn't travel over very much forest. So air travelling over forests, over trees, cr- picks up the moisture from the trees and eventually creates rainfall. When we, uh, we when we deforest areas, we uh, we lose that rain. So that's just how it is. Another thing as well is Australia's most expensive resort was destroyed yesterday in the bushfires in Kangaroo Island. This place is about five thousand dollars a night, and you can sort of see what it was. You can sort of see there. This is before, and now this is after. It's literally just melted, just melted. That long line of little uh, hotel suites or rooms, very, very nice. Melted. Crazy. This is what it was. Again, you can still see there's burnt out, the dining area. Burnt out. Watch this. Check this out. across New South Wales are fighting to save their towns as the bushfire emergency roared back to life. Right now, more than 140 fires burning across the state, 11 at emergency level. That intimidating, eerie darkness returned to a number of towns. In Sydney, the heat's been extraordinary, breaking new records at Penrith, hitting 48.9 degrees at 3 o'clock. And as we come on the air, the hunt for arsonists in our west and southwest. But first, Robert Avadia has the latest on the south coast threat. Intimidating pictures from an RFS helicopter west of Nowra as the Kurrawan fire roared into new life today. A house was right in front of the flare-up. It's moving fast, coastal residents warned to seek shelter. And at Nelligen, west of Batemans Bay, another monster. Several homes in the line of fire there. Uh, friends, yes. We had to burn down by the looks of it. Whipped up by strong north to northwesterly winds. Firefighters are exhausted and one cannot contain his anger. You from the media, tell the Prime Minister to go and get from Nelligan. And from a female colleague to the PM. Stand down now. High emotion amid desperate, dangerous and almost deadly work. That sees that first firefighter collapse by the roadside. I've lost seven houses already in Nelligan, I'm not going to lose any more. It was close, but heroic efforts saw most saved. 50 kilometres south at Bendalong, near Lake Conjola, fire tearing through the trees, what looks to be a bush cottage under threat. Waterbombing helicopters respond. But flames are soon roaring above the treetops as police warn residents of what's coming. Another outbreak, 70 kilometres south at Batemans Bay being fanned by northerly winds towards homes at Long Beach and Surfside, flames within metres of houses. 
This was the scene from the ground, the circular pattern typical of spot fires started by embers. Every available water bombing aircraft has been called up, this one filling up on the Maruya River. For much of today, it looked like southern New South Wales had dodged a bullet, an inversion layer keeping smoke close to the ground, shading and cooling the earth. By midday, temperatures were in the mid-20s, not the 40-plus that was forecast. But then the smoke lifted and the wind picked up. Suddenly, fires rated as watch and act flared into emergencies, one after another. Several of them were in the snowy region, the Kosciuszko National Park, and to the northwest in the Batlow Tumbarumba area. Batlow is practically a ghost town after most of its 1,400 citizens fled, but not publican Linda Rudd, not yet. We'll stay as long as it's safe and we've got plans in place. RFS Chief Shane Fitzsimmons went live on 7 with this warning. The dangerous afternoon is starting to unfold. He had sent 3,000 volunteers into the field today, 31 strike teams, each of five trucks, hoping they wouldn't be needed, fearing they would the state's highest ever level of preparedness. When the southerly does come in, that change in weather will exacerbate existing conditions. We are in for a long night. Residents in Maruya are well aware of the risks. If it gets into the trees, there's, there's, you know, just have to leave straight away. This family packing their SUV, ready to hit the road. I've got everything I could possibly fit. Kids photos. Everything's ready to rock and roll, so if she starts to glow around here, it gets too sus, we're out of here, mate, you know, for sure. And Robert Avadi is in Maria tonight. Rob, good evening. That expected southerly change, has it reached you yet? Good evening, Michael. Yeah, it has. Uh, certainly not to the tune of 80 kilometres an hour, and it is definitely colder. You can tell that. You might be able to see the trees moving behind me, but here in Maruya, it is actually a godsend. So uh, the southerly is coming from that direction. The flames are in that direction. When it was a northwesterly, they were threatening the town. Now the wind is pushing the flames away. So Maruya, it seems, will be spared by this, in spite of the fact it was predicted to be right at the forefront of this disaster. The southerly is moving through. It's moving uh, up north the coast from what I understand it is certainly close to Batemans Bay and the threat looming potentially tonight might be in the St George's Basin. Michael. Okay Rob, Rob, thank you. Robert Avadi in Maruya. Further north in Batemans Bay hundreds of people are spending the night at local campgrounds as fire rages towards their homes. The area is under intense water bombing from firefighting aircraft. Jeff Parry has been with the residents fighting to save their homes who've been told it's too late to leave. A steady and furious blaze roaring towards homes at Nelligan. Unrelenting, tearing through bushland. No, doing their job. That's what they're there for. Fire trucks screaming through North Batemans Bay, heading straight for the thick, dark smoke looming over residents. Oh, oh, it's way dark. Oh. Dozens of new blazes have been fanned by hot, dry and gusty conditions. Firefighters using every resource to try to get on top. Ex-RFS volunteers Wendy and Joe stayed to defend their property, hoping the water in their tank can last the night. Yep, that's the best thing. We filled the gutters with socks. The gutters are all full. The plan is to uh, put as much water on the house as possible uh, to save it. The fire itself is only about 100 metres down that way. It is burning slowly, but the wind is coming towards the home and the uh, fire service, rural fire service, has uh, just shown up. Uh, on the scene. For hundreds of others who fled to safety, it's an anxious wait. We don't know if we're going to have a house or not, you know, after today, so... Um. We just, we're just sister waiting, uh, wait yeah. and see. Crammed into a camping ground and prepared for the worst. We'll just go to the water and bunk it down in the water. And see what happens. Mm. Hopefully it turns for the better. And the worst is on the way. Emergency alert level blazes burning all around them. Those at North Batemans Bay told it's too late to leave living out of their cars and camper vans a little longer. Well, let's go to Jeff now at North Batemans Bay tonight. Jeff, good evening. What's the latest where you are? Well, Michael, you can see the roadblock uh, behind me. That's the Princess Highway. That's blocked. Uh, and the reason being that that, uh, that bush area that you can see behind me, that's, uh, that's uh, North Batemans Bay. Um, we've just had an unconfirmed report that they're up there now trying to save a house, uh, that this fire has regenerated, and there is a house there under threat of stress that is unconfirmed. But they've been up there all day, the water bombers, the fire brigade, to try and save the homes up there. This is part of the Clyde Mountain Fire, which is um, at an emergency alert level. That's impacting in 
North Batemans, and that, of course, has a wash-on effect for areas like Surf, uh, uh, Surfside, uh, Long Beach, and even all the way up to Durris. So you can see uh, that part of the highway is closed. The King's Highway is also closed up to Clyde Mountain. And uh, to add insult to injury, Michael, um, about uh, 10,000 or more homes in this area, including thousands in that impacted area down Surfside and uh, Long Beach, uh, are without power tonight, which means they have no which means they have no um, ways of, uh, of uh, cooking their food or air conditioning or anything like that. Michael, back to you. All right, good on you, Jeff. Thank you for that. Now, in the state's snowy mountains, a new emergency is unfolding with the entire communities left in darkness. As thick smoke blankets that region, the small Kosciuszko towns surrounding Tumut are at most risk tonight, and Chris Reason has that story. The snowy mountains, today, anything but. The view from on board an RFS helicopter a threat authorities had warned of all week, now a reality. This is Cooma, plunged into darkness. At 5.05 in Cooma, New South Wales, it is as dark as midnight out here. If we come out of today um, with no lives lost, that will be a good thing. In Threadboat, snow guns turned into fire hoses, protecting the resort. Dozens of communities across the valley told to seek shelter. The loss of homes considered all but inevitable. The likelihood is that we will lose property um, in a lot of different areas today. To the northwest in Batlow and Tumut, it didn't take long for things to kick off. There's a spot fire up here and there's a spot fire over on the other side here. But some residents refuse to leave. I'm going to try to stay inside my house. I live my back up and up to the bush up here. I'm staying. I need to try and defend my house. Others that hung around rallied together. It's just been overwhelming, the response that we've had from local businesses. There are too many to name. With one hotel keeping its doors open for those with nowhere else to go. We've been open all week. We're not closing. Is there a reason why? <laughs> this town's our home. But others didn't need to be told making an escape before it was too late. We just want them all safe, that's the main thing. Lucky to get out before the Snowy Mountains Highway closed and before conditions get a lot worse. We are in for a long night and I, I make no bones about that. We're in for a long night. Chris Reason, 7 News. And now the federal government is moving in. Prime Minister Scott Morrison says he will no longer wait for the states to request assistance. It means thousands of Defence Force resources are on their way to the fire grounds as we speak. Tim Lester has the story from Naruma, a town directly impacted by the deadly fires on the south coast. The tiny historic town Tilba, nestled in south coast bushland. We're here to try and protect the village. Five days ago here, they watched a hellish glow on the southern horizon the deadly fire front swallowing much of neighbour towns Cabago and Kwama. Our life's more important than our property. Today, John Matthews is hosing down the town's historic courthouse. There's tons of old, old timber underneath the house. Now, the same fire is poised to hit Tilba and its weatherboard history. When it comes to, I may well bail out. It's, I'm just here just wetting everything down, making sure it's all, you know, sort of secure. Disaster response has long been a state responsibility. Now, the Prime Minister says Canberra is stepping in. To ensure that we're giving everything that is needed on the ground, without being asked, we'll be turning up. Scott Morrison claims it as a major shift. No waiting for states to seek help. Canberra moves in anyway. The response that is required is to get the boots on the ground, to get the planes in the air, to get the ships out to sea. Cabinet's National Security Committee has decided to deploy 3,000 Army reservists across the fire grounds, the first ever compulsory call-up for reservists to go to natural disasters. It's your Defence Force and we're here to serve you. More military choppers are on their way. HMAS Adelaide has sailed south from Sydney to help with evacuations. The government also spending 20 million to lease four more firefighting aircraft. It's late morning. This is the road into the coastal village of Bermagui. Fire authorities say you should not be driving out on this road and you certainly should not be driving in. But life doesn't work that way. If it comes over the top of the mountain, I'm just going to be yeah, we're going to be in trouble. And if these towns burn to the ground... We will rebuild. Though in Tilba they know you can't rebuild history. It matters to you, this place? 
well, you know, it matters to everybody, I think, not just to me. It's, it's the National Trust Village. Let's go to Tim Lester now in the room. Tim, it is looking ominous where you are. What's the latest there? Well, Michael, uh, this town, Naruma, has been losing the light in smoke haze since early afternoon. We now have virtual darkness two and a quarter hours before the scheduled sunset. But the more important change, the one Rob was discussing in Maruya earlier, the southern winds have hit Naruma now. The wind gusts are stronger, but they're coming from a quarter where there are no 